Assalamu alaikum and greetings. My name is Hassan Mahmoud. I represent the matters of uh, Sharia and Islamic law on behalf of Muslim Canadian Congress, MCC. Today, me and Brother Mubin Sheikh is here with me. We will discuss one of the most important issues uh, of Muslim society and humanity as a whole, that is Sharia, the Islamic law, on the context of Islamic Institute, Institute of Civil Justice and Muslim Court of Arbitration, uh, henceforth Sharia law, Sharia Court of Canada. To <coughs> maintain is that this is not a debate to win or defeat each other or whatever. This is a discussion. We will, we may address each other's point or not and at the end we will come to a conclusion on our behalf but not on your behalf. You are the judge. This is, this is a very vast subject. We can probably only touch a very minute little part of it. So now it's Brother Mubin Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Mubin Sheikh, as the brother mentioned. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually a spokesperson for Masjid Al Noor that is currently practicing Islamic ADR, Sharia arbitration. And uh, again, to our context of discussion along the lines of the Islamic Institute of Civil Justice, uh, we'll, we'll talk on, I will talk on two things. One, the Sharia, the laws, the context of that and the context of this particular arbitration board and how things work in an arbitration setting. Uh, for starters, uh, I'm going to draw my framework around the understanding of Sharia as it has come to us through the Quran, through the Sunnah, through the examples of the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, those who followed the Sahaba and those who followed them including the Imams Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, Malik, and Hanbali, and Hanbal, Ahmad bin Hanbal. And the methodology that emerged from this that has resulted in this code of law which we call fiqh or is encompassed under the umbrella title Sharia. <clears throat> Basically, I'll begin with four points uh, that I feel are very important for us to understand from the beginning. And that is, the revealed principles of law cover all aspects of human behavior, human activity. Um, number two, that the revealed law is binding on the whole community. And even the Prophet, peace be upon him, had to follow what was revealed to him. Allah says to him, now we have sent thee, O Muhammad, on a clear road, on a sharia. Ja'alnaka ala shari'atin of our commandment. So follow it and follow not the desires of those who know not. Um, again, another place Allah says, this is the book we have sent down, blessed. So follow it and be God-fearing that perhaps you will find mercy. Um, again, and O Muhammad, follow that which is revealed to you and forbear it until Allah gives His judgment. He is the best of judges. Um, Finally, very important point or very important ayah here. The Quran rebukes those whose conduct violates the Sharia and praises those whose conduct conforms to it. Allah says, they say, we believe in God and in the Apostle and we obey. But even after that, some of them turn away. They are not truly believers. When they are summoned to God and His Apostle in order that He may judge between them, Behold, some of them decline to come. But if the right is on their side, they come to him in all submission. Is it that there is a disease in their hearts? Or are they in fear that God and his apostle will deal unjustly with them? Nay, it is they themselves who do wrong. The response of the believers when summoned to God and his apostle in order that he may judge between them is no other than this. They say, we hear and we obey. It is such as these who will attain felicity. It is such as those that obey God and His Apostle and fear God and do right that will win in the end. The third point is whoever does not follow the revealed law and does not judge according to it is counted as an unbeliever. And Allah says in the Quran, 
uh, Quran chapter 5 verse 44 and when it is said to them uh, sorry whoever judges not according to what Allah has sent down they are the unbelievers and there is actually a clarification on this this means that a person who believes that man-made law is inherently superior to Sharia violates a most basic principle of Islam but those who accept that yes Sharia is superior to man-made law in theory and when it's applied properly but for some failing or for some other reason implement man-made law then they become or they are in the category of sinners and not unbelievers and point number four the revealed law is inalterable it cannot be changed so even the prophet could not do so of his own so it says here the ayah here is uh, 26 Quran chapter 10 verse 15 and when our clear revelations are recited unto them those who do not anticipate the meeting with us those who don't believe say bring a Quran other than this or change it Allah says to Muhammad say O Muhammad it is not for me to change it of my own accord I only follow that which is revealed to me lo if I were to disobey my Lord I would fear the retribution of a terrible day so this is the the what Allah has mentioned to us in the Quran with respect to following the Sharia the role of the Prophet and this is the proof of the Sunnah as a source of law uh, the, pro the Allah has said here uh, we have revealed unto thee the re remembrance that you may explain to mankind that which has been revealed for them and in order that they may give thought uh, his role as legislator um, Quran chapter 7 verse 157 he will make lawful for them all good things and prohibit for them only the foul and, re and will relieve them of their burdens and fetters which were set upon them those who believe in him honor and help him and who follow the light which is sent down with him, they are successful. Uh, finally, or just two more points, uh, point number three, uh, muta', the one who is to be obeyed. So it says here, we have sent no messenger save that he should be obeyed by Allah's permission. Say, obey Allah and the messenger, but if they turn away, Allah loves not the unbelievers. See, Allah has connected belief and unbelief with following Allah and his messenger. And the fourth point, the model for Muslim behavior. Um, Quran 33 verse 21. You have in Allah's Messenger a noble model for all those, for all whose hopes are in Allah in the last day and who often call Allah to remembrance. So the point of this is to show the role of the Quran and the Sunnah as the primary sources of law. When Allah has determined a matter, <coughs> when the Prophet ﷺ has determined a matter, has clarified an issue, then we obey. We follow. This is what is revealed. We obey. Other than that, we can move around. We have room for uh, for movement. So, and then this is where we will see that a lot of the Sharia, a lot of the points that come out, which are apparently problematic, or are real, really problematic. Um, you know, which which brings a, a state of uh, Sharia phobia. Which, uh, which is unfortunate. People have, uh, have, have come into this, and rightfully so, I think, because of the way Sharia is misapplied, misabused. You know, it has become a tool of oppression and injustice versus it being a channel of justice and uh, liberation from evil. So, that being said, it is important for us to understand the context of the Sharia itself. Um, and then we can get into the specifics of how the Sharia will be implemented in the here and now. And this is something that I will touch upon in my, in my uh, second section on this specific issue. I just want to present this particular point as uh, education for the people so that they understand in what kind of framework we operate. Um, again, Allah has mentioned in the Quran the methodology of of law, of legal understanding, of legal uh, exercise. And we see in many ayat, Allah has said that, you know, when you dispute um, in an issue, bring it back to Allah and His Messenger. In other places, He has said that, you know, uh, ask those who, who, ask those who know, or who are in, who are those who are of knowledge, people of knowledge, Ahl al-Dhikr, actually. And uh, it also mentions that, uh, um, that we return matters back to those who are in charge over our affairs. 
So these provide a methodology for us so that we understand that, okay, on the issue of, you know, theft, what do, where do we go? We go to the Qur'an. The Qur'an has made it clear. You know, the punishment for theft. And the, the jurists even dissected this a bit, that you have the punishment for theft is amputation of one of the hands. And the jurists went into this. They said, well, okay, it's only certain, you know, certain things over a certain value or whether or not the, the, you know, the thing was being protected or whether it was in a guarded area to steal that, okay, that's theft. Of course, the scholars also looked at issues like if people are starving and you're stealing to survive, then that's not a crime as far as Allah is concerned because Allah has mentioned in places that, look, where there is necessity, if you are dying and the only thing for you to eat is pork, then you are ordered to eat pork. You're supposed to eat pork to sustain just enough to be to remain alive. So even this issue of theft where it's very general in the Quran, the Sunnah specifies it. And the Imams specify it and they say, look, in these conditions. So we will see this with a lot of issues. Um, some of the issues that will be raised such as uh, the, 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 the witnessing of women in, in financial transactions that you know, people have taken this to mean that the you know a woman is half of that of a man, which is not correct, or that testimony of, of uh, one woman is equal to, to two men or two women is equal to one man, which is incorrect as a general rule, because this applies to financial issues, financial matters, and at that time women were not versed in finance and commerce and trade, etc. And we can see today that the situation is very different. Uh, we were mentioning earlier that you know I'm terrible at math. And uh, I'm probably not even one third of, a, of, a, of this ideal woman. <coughs> so, so we we look at these things in their context and the divine intent. What was Allah intending at that moment? And uh, then we will be able to get a better picture of how these laws emerge. Uh, you know why they use these methodologies, etc. Thank you. Uh, as you have uh, appreciated the contextuality of of uh, these legal rulings. Uh, and you say that uh, the two, two women is, is equal to one man in witness uh, is not valid anymore. There, uh, there we are really appreciating the contextuality and, and cultural variability of the Quran. Nobody denies that it came in 7th century. Nobody denies that it had to handle some specific questions of people of 7th century. So many ayats are there. People say, what about this? What about that? Now, those are not our questions. But come back, coming back to the real done laws, this is from Dr. Hashim Kamali, which who we can call the Einstein of mathematics today, Einstein of Islamic jurisprudence. He says, I have cons consequently commented on the nature of the challenge that Muslim scholars and jurists must take up if the met methodology of usul al-fiqh and ijtihad are to be re revitalized and integrated into the process of law and governments of modern times. That never happened. Now what is Sharia? He also says that however, Owing to a variety of factors, usul al-fiqh is no longer applicable of serving the goals for which it was originally designed and developed. Uh, the, why the failures are there, that is about the scholars and researchers. We are commoners. We are the users of end product. We don't bother about the 30,000 pages research and development of a car or of, of our computer. I, brought, I have brought a tablet. This tablet has a long and um, Himalayan amount of uh, uh, 